Wow, good morning. Your singing was so pretty. Sounded amazing. Thank you. What another exciting Sunday to be here at Bridge Christian Church. We are going to launch right into our fourth and final installment of this Open Doors series. Uh, I've learned so much. I hope you have. Um, I wanted to give you a heads up on two quick things that are near and dear to my heart, two things going on right now here at Bridge. We are entering our final month of uh, open signups for our men's adventure retreats. If you haven't had a chance to be a part of one of those guys, I can't encourage you highly enough to take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, if your wife's been nudging you and elbowing you to do it, just do it. Step out there and uh, try something that'll, that'll certainly stretch you and, and move you into a new place in your spiritual faith. Secondly, we are about to host our warm shelter. Uh, we bring our homeless community right here to Bridge, and they actually stay here for seven days. And uh, we serve them and fix meals and, uh, and get to spend some time with them. I wish you would take part in that, that you would look at the sign up for the warm shelter and find a place. There's all kinds of simple ways that you can serve with that wonderful event. As we move into this final week of open doors, I wonder if you've ever tried something hard. Anybody in here ever in their heart determined, you know what would be a good idea? I think I want to and fill in the blank. And then you realized, oh, what have I done? Have you ever had a moment where you're like, this would be a great, and then it wasn't. I read a story recently about a man named Richard Plowd. Richard was a man that woke up one day and for whatever reason decided he wanted to build the world's tallest Eiffel Tower out of matchsticks. My question exactly, like, why would anyone do that? I don't know. It was a lonely moment, something, and he decided he wanted to do it. So sure enough, he started to buy matchsticks, clipped off the little end, and he started to glue them together until he finally built a structure. It took him eight years that was over two and a half stories tall, all built out of little wooden matchsticks, 709 thousand individually placed, individually glued Mac sticks until he had an unbelievable Eiffel Tower. <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> right? Who has time for this? But he did. And so he called the Guinness Book of World Records and he said, hey, you won't believe what I've done. And I'm sure they're like, oh, we would. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's the Guinness Book of World Records. So they called him in and they, and they walked around it and uh, they studied it closely. And then they called him over and they said, Mr. Plowd, your structure does not qualify. <sighs> I don't know what would cause me to jump off a cliff, but if I spent eight years building that and they said, you know, it's just not quite right. And so they, they said, listen, we just need you to know those are the wrong matchsticks. For real, have you seen what's in the Guinness Book of World Records? You could shove marshmallows up your nose and get in the Guinness Book of World Records. And somehow, so listen, the, the internet just roasted poor Guinness book. I mean, it was like, are you kidding me? They called him the next day, Mr. Plow, this Guinness book again. He hadn't jumped off the ledge yet, but I'm sure he answered the phone from the ledge. And, uh, and they said, sir, we just want you to know we're going to accept your record. So this man has done something incredible in eight years of his life. Have you ever started something? You had a dream, you had a goal, some New Year's resolution, and as you charged into it, you were so excited, but then in the grind and the years and the months, as the days went by, the sparkle started to wear off. The dream faded and all you were left with was pain and regret forever starting to begin with. I wonder if someone's ever talked to you into running a 5K. Anyone in here ever done that? Somewhere in the first mile, it was like, there's no way that person is my friend. <laughs> Why would someone that cares about me encourage me to do this? I wonder how many millions of dollars have been earned by companies from some get-rich-quick idea, from some thing that they advertised as easy until you bought it. I have to admit, in full transparency, I've never actually finished a Rubik's Cube. 
I mean, when you see it on TV, when you see those little kids do it, it's just so simple. Now, I've changed all the stickers around. For sure, but I've never actually gotten it to go back to where it started. It's possible that you have felt some of those same feelings about following Jesus. Depending on what you were told when you were learning about becoming a Christian, you might have been told that all you have to do is repeat a few words, get baptized if you want, and go to church when you can. And then, presto, your ticket to heaven is punched. You're a bona fide follower of Jesus. However, this line of thinking runs into some serious problems when it's actually compared and held up to Scripture. Listen to these words of Jesus in Luke 13. Work hard. Now, this word in different translations is also uh, given to us as strive, make every effort. Let me start again. Work hard, strive, make every effort to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom. For many will try to enter, but will fail. Here and in several other places, the Lord reminds us that the entry, the doorway to heaven, is difficult and challenging to find to even enter. It's Jesus teaching about this narrow door, this narrow way. That will conclude this series today. The modern message of an easy pathway, free of, free of obstacles, of sacrifice and cost, is a half-truth at best. At worst, it's unbiblical, misleading, and even destructive in our lives. Now, in some ways, the Bible can seem to be filled with a double standard when it comes to the effort and cost of becoming a Christian. When we hear the words of Jesus in Matthew 11... He says, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. We might be left with the impression that the journey with Jesus will be easy, comfortable, gentle, even fun. I mean, it says it right here. Jesus wants to take away all your heavy burdens and bring you peace and rest. However, in today's scripture... We also read that Jesus taught his disciples to work hard to enter, the, to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom, for many will enter, will try to enter, but will fail. To complicate matters even further, can I stretch this even further? The Bible seems to teach that entering the door of God's salvation is also both free and costly. Listen as the Apostle Paul teaches in Ephesians 2. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for doing good things. We have done so none of us can boast about it. And yet Jesus in Luke 14 would say this to complicate matters further. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation are not able to finish, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. So how can following Jesus be both very difficult and costly, yet simultaneously free and easy? I'd like to deal with those seemingly opposing truths in Scripture one at a time. I hope in the short time we have today that you will find that they actually dovetail, connect perfectly together. Question one, how can entering the door of Jesus' salvation be both free and and easy? I wonder, free and costly? I wonder if you've found this old saying to be true in your own life. Nothing is for free. The older I get, the more I find myself saying things my dad used to say. It's kind of annoying, really. (laughs) My kids will see some advertisement, some opportunities, and, uh, Dad, look, it's free. Nothing's for free, son. 
Isn't it true though? Don't put your email in that box. Don't give them your phone number. That's not for free. Just because something is free doesn't mean that it won't be very expensive. I wonder if anyone here has ever bought a fixer-upper. Anyone ever delved into some opportunity, some fixer-upper? Maybe it was a car, a home, an old piece of furniture, or a rescue pet. We bring these things into our busy lives because they are affordable. We also see great potential in them and look forward to restoring them to their former grandeur, sometimes even better than the original. So we buy that old car for 500 bucks, that slightly leaning house on the corner for 50 grand. We pick up that broken piece of dilapidated furniture for $10. After all, it has good bones. Then there's the rescue pet. We have images of pet nirvana as we throw tennis balls at the dog park with our purebred German shepherd we picked up for 35 bucks. <laughs> After all, they cost a couple thousand on Facebook Marketplace. Now, it's not to say that there aren't exceptions for what I'm about to share, but from my experience, these deals have cost me a fortune. Sherry and I bought our first home on South Linden Avenue, 601 South Linden Avenue. We were so excited. We were in our early 20s. We were newly married, and we had no money, and so we were looking for a deal, and so we found this slightly leaning house on the corner of 601 South Linden Avenue, and we bought it with excitement and vigor. We couldn't wait to make it our own to put our stamp on it, and so we tore into that house with everything we had. For months, we tore up old carpet, we fixed old plaster walls, we went home with our nostrils filled with the smell of sawdust and plaster dust and lead paint. I'll probably die early because of that house. <laughs> After some months of working in it and ruining all of our friendships, <laughs> you know what friend credit is? <laughs> There's a certain amount of credit your friends will give you before they stop being your friend. <laughs> I can remember going to Lowe's, to Home Depot, to Ace Hardware so often I no longer had to steer the car there. You just got in and it would take you. The seats strewn with receipts as that little fixer upper, that steal of a deal cost us an incredible amount of money. Then there's the matter of our free and cheap pets. Those commercials of new pet owners frolicking in the backyard with their $35 rescue dog. Or the sweet kitten that lovingly brushes against your leg only when only days before it lived in the trash cans in some alley. Those commercials are so misleading. <laughs> Our shelter pets dug, scratched, chewed, clawed, and injured themselves to the tune of thousands of dollars. I had a friend, true story, that invested so much in his scraggly little shelter pet that when it finally died and went home to be with Jesus, he mounted it and put it on his shelf. <laughs> <laughs> it was so disturbing. <laughs> Because you knew the dog, and I remember the first time I walked in his house, and at that time I was actually on his mantle, and he walked in, it's like, oh, wow. And <laughs> there's little Scruffy, like, just full stride. He's full stride. <laughs> so weird. Did we eventually have some great memories in that old fixer-upper? And with our discount pets, of course. Would I describe the experience as free? No. I can say that I've experienced that same balance of both free and costly in my relationship with Jesus. Have you? To the point, to this point, I've never received a bill. I've never received an invoice from the Lord for the incredible price that he paid to release me from my sin. His grace was truly free. The value of his free gift became all the more impressive when I began to consider that before Christ, I was on spiritual death row. 
Paul writes in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. One sin is all it takes to separate us from a holy God and from eternity with him. Friends, before I accepted and found Jesus Christ, my life would be defined by an eternal death and an eternal hell. But in the midst of my helpless state, in the midst of our helpless state, someone shared the gospel, the good news of salvation. I accepted freely. But from that moment on, the journey from that point has been very costly. The personal cost of changing me from the person that God found to the person he wants me to be. Friend, that process has been so very costly. Remember again the words of Luke 14. In the same way, those of you who do not want to give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Our willingness to let go of our earthly desires and treasures and to follow Jesus are essential to finding the true and rich life that he offers. I love the words of the Apostle Paul, a man that was by all definitions successful, powerful, known, and important. And he would write after meeting Jesus, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. Do you see the change of perspective of this man that thought he had everything? Friends, when Paul received the free gift of salvation, he saw how much garbage he had collected in his life. And what did Paul do? He threw this world's treasure aside. He turned from his old life and ways and began chasing a new definition of what it means to succeed. It's ironic from the world's perspective as they look at our lives as Christians that it seems like it's cost us so much to follow Jesus, but in reality, what we have actually done is exchanged dirt for dollars, temporary trash for eternal treasure. So, Salvation is free. And how is something so grand, so wonderful, and so beautiful free? Because God paid for it. Someone had to pay to free me from the sin that I had in my life. Listen to the Apostle Peter write, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Your part, your cost from the moment you accept Jesus as Lord is reflected in a challenge that we share here at Bridge routinely. Come as you are, but don't stay as you are. Why would we come to this church one day and five years later look exactly the same? What have we robbed from ourselves if we arrive here in such brokenness and need of a Savior and five years later the only thing we've done is recite some words, get dunked in the baptistry and never change? The invitation to follow Jesus is free. The journey of growing to be like him could cost you everything. And then the second question. How can entering the door of Jesus' salvation be both easy and hard? Let's look at this apparent contradiction in the Bible. Remember the words of Jesus again in our theme verse for today. Work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom, for many will try to enter but will fail. While at the same time Paul teaches in Romans 9, so it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor work for it. 
what's happening here? How can it be both difficult, striving, and hard, and yet at the same time, we cannot work to earn it? Like the conversation we had about salvation being both free and costly, many of the same conclusions will work with this conundrum of our faith. When it comes to the work, the effort that is required to be saved, Jesus alone has paved the way. Let me read this time from Ephesians 2 and the NIV. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The Bible is clear. Salvation is received based on one simple act. That act is faith. Paul teaches in Romans 1, the good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. When you made the simple and profound decision to believe that Jesus was Lord, that God sent him to die on a Roman cross for our sins, that singular decision opens the doorway for eternity for each person in this room. Nothing within our power could earn that eternal blessing. But then that, that is where the hard work begins. Life provides us with so many great examples of decisions that will prove to be both easy and hard. You can get married in 10 minutes. In Vegas, you don't even have to get out of your car. <laughs> you can conceive a child in a moment of pleasure. You can apply for a credit card at the cash register, get a school loan in just minutes. You can enter into any of these life-altering commitments with practically no planning or preparation. Just enter. But then after a short time has passed, the reality of what you have decided to do begins to slip in, doesn't it? Sherry and I have been married now for 27 years. We've raised three children into adulthood. But what I want to know is why are there so many warning labels on cigarettes and energy drinks and none for people entering into these enormously difficult things. No one warned Sherry and I what it would be like to bring two people with such different lives into a single union. We never knew what it would be like to raise teenage girls, <laughs> a teenage boys. These things were so easy to enter into, but they have been so difficult to walk through. Friends, the decision to enter the race takes almost no effort, but the will to finish, that will likely take everything you have. This is also true of entering the Christian faith. The call to come as you are, but don't stay where you are, starts with a simple decision. A decision to accept Jesus' free gift of salvation. But then, then the command to be shaped and molded into Jesus' likeness is where the real work lives. I love these words by the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 12. No discipline, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So take a new grip with your tired hands. Strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong. Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living out a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. This is what it means to work, to strive, to enter the narrow door. Salvation is absolutely free. Yet following our Savior could cost you everything. Jesus really does promise rest to those that trust in him. But the decision to be transformed into his likeness 
will likely be the hardest thing you have ever done. When we begin to fully understand the great gift we've been given by our Lord, when the true reality of what he has done for us in our helpless lost condition sinks into our hearts and minds, how do we not come to him with anything but thanksgiving and praise? That is what we do each Sunday as we come to this simple meal called communion. It is a recognition that what is represented here was a tremendous price of infinite value, the blood of Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus Christ exchanged for you and I. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving something so costly and precious for a people that were so lost, so broken, and aimless in our lives. Thank you for finding us in our moment of need and giving us meaning and value. Father, I pray that as we take this meal again today, it would be so special in our hands. Amen.